I'm going to be making videos to complement the probability portion of CS70. The goal of the videos is to give a good summary of the lecture notes so that people who don't have enough time to read them before lecture can uh, still have a good idea of what's going on. These videos will by no means be exhaustive. Uh, they're just intended to give a summary of the notes. And if other people uh, don't understand certain concepts, hopefully I'll be able to explain some of them. Uh, the goal of these videos is to be concise, cogent, and informative. So here we go. Uh, this video will be on lecture notes 10, which is counting. As I said, we're going to be talking about probability overall. So let's set the scene with an example. Uh, suppose I flip a thousand coins. What's the probability of getting exactly 500 heads? Well, we know there's a certain number of total possible outcomes of flipping a thousand coins. So the likelihood of flipping exactly 500 heads is the number of outcomes with exactly 500 heads in them divided by the number of total possible outcomes of flipping a thousand coins. And this comes out to be equal to 2.5%. We use this example to illustrate the importance of counting in probability. In fact, we can even say that counting forms the basis for probability. So there's two different ways we're going to need to count. The first is with replacement, and the second is without replacement. For with replacement, you can imagine when rolling dice, uh, if you roll a 6 on a given turn, that doesn't mean you can't roll a 6 on the next turn. Uh, your, all your possibilities have been sort of replaced. Without replacement, you can imagine a deck of cards in which if you draw the ace of spades on the first draw, then you're unable to draw the ace of spades on the next. This brings us to the first rule of counting. The first rule of counting says that Suppose you have a certain number of decisions that you're going to make. Uh, let's just say three. And there are n one ways that you can make the first decision, n two ways you can make the second decision, and n three ways that you can make the final decision. What the first rule of counting says is that the number of total ways that you can make decisions, period, is equal to n one times n two times n three. And you can imagine generalizing this to a case of k decisions you're going to make. Another way to think about this is as a tree. And uh, let's give a concrete example for that. So imagine you have two ways that you can make the first decision, three ways that you can make the second, and again, two ways that you can make the third. So let's imagine we're here to start. And then decision N1 has two options for it. right? And at that point, you have three options for each of the N1 decisions you made uh, for N2. And then after that, you have two options for each of those at n3. And you should have 12 leaves based on the first rule of counting. And I believe that I do. Uh, so let's apply the first rule of counting to a couple of cases. So let's talk about the with replacement case first. So imagine you are rolling dice, right? So if you have k rolls, then the first rule of counting says that the number of total possibilities for your k rolls is going to be 6 to the k, because on the first roll you had 6 options, second roll you had 6 options, etc., all the way to k rolls, so you're going to get 6 to the k. It all, let's take the example where you're doing this without replacement. So again, we are use our example of cards, which we've been using, and that says that uh, if the number of ways to draw five cards is going to be 52, which is the number of choices you have for the first one, times 51, second one, times 50, times 49, times 48, because these are the numbers of choices you have at each step. And actually, a better way to write this would be to say this is 52 bang over 47 bang. And this actually points us towards a general form for counting without replacement, which says that the total number of ways to pick k different things out of n possibilities without replacement is equal to n bang over n minus k bang, where when I say bang, I'm referring to factorial. Uh, my dad does it that way, and he's cool, so I do too. Uh, 
Uh, but if you notice, we've actually double counted a lot of possibilities. We've made a distinction between a hand in which you draw the ace of spades first followed by the jack of hearts uh, and one where you draw the jack of hearts first followed by the ace of spades when in poker uh, this would actually be the same hand and inherently this is, this is the same thing. So let's suppose that we wanted to count uh, the number of distinct five card hands that you can draw. So this actually brings us to uh, the second rule of counting which we will illustrate with this example itself. So <clears throat> back to the example we want to pick distinct five card hands so uh, let's let's start by saying we know that this is somehow going to include the total number of possible five card hands. So let's say our count is equal to the number of possible hands, which is equal to uh, 52 bang over 47 bang. And then we know that we want to divide this by the number of duplicate possibilities per good possibility. So what we're going to divide this by is the number of ways to order the five card hand itself. So intuitively this should make a lot of sense because that's the number of duplicate versions of each possible hand that you're going to get. So we know that from actually the first rule of counting that the number of ways to order any five card hand is five possibilities for the four first card, four possibilities for the next, three, two, one, which we know is five bang. Uh, so this actually brings us towards uh, the notation of n choose k. And a lot of the times when you get further into probability, you just kind of tend to forget where this came from. It's like, oh, I, I, you know you're doing n choose k, but you, and you have the formula, but you kind of forget why you're doing this. So, again, so just keep in mind, I'm going to say that n choose k is the number of ways to choose k things from n objects divided by uh, the number of ways to order those k things, which the formula says is equal to n bang over n minus k bang k bang. So anytime you forget the intuition for why n choose k has the formula that it does, just come back to this and you'll be able to see. Uh, so <coughs> now we're going to go to ways of manipulating this formula for n choose k and sort of having an intuitive grasp for why these manipulations are okay and what they mean. So the first one we're going to do is that n choose k is the same thing as n choose n minus k. Uh, now what this is saying is that the number of ways to or, or rather the number of five card hands you can choose is equal to the number of 47 card hands you can choose. And at first thought, that seems a bit absurd, but if you give it a little, if you think about it for a little longer, you'll realize that uh, the num choosing five cards really isn't so different from choosing 47 cards. 
in a deck of 52 cards because anytime you choose five cards, that's the same thing as picking 47 cards out of the deck and throwing them away, saying that they're not in your hand. So they're effectively doing the same thing, and there's an equal number of ways way of picking out five cards from a deck as there are of throwing away 47 cards from a deck. So as a result, there's an equal number of way, ways of choosing 47 cards out of a deck. And uh, algebraically, this is more obvious than it is intuitively. It just says that n bang over n minus k bang k bang is equal to n bang over n minus n minus k bang uh, n minus k bang. Uh, so this, these cancel and the k comes out. And algebraically this is quite obvious, but the, the intuitive argument for it is actually a lot more important. Uh, let's move on to another guy which says that n choose k is equal to n minus 1 choose k minus 1 plus n minus 1 choose k. So in order to illustrate this example, uh, let's imagine we're doing 5 choose 3. So let's put a bunch of objects on the table. Uh, this is one object, two objects, three objects, four objects, five objects, right? And let's uh, name these objects. Uh, let's, let's name them the first object, the second object, the third object, the fourth object, and the fifth object. And uh, just make sure you realize that we're not imposing an ordering on these objects. We're actually just giving them names. So you could put quotes around them, and they would effectively be saying the same thing. Uh, so we're just, we've just given these objects on the table a name. Uh, so what this formula is saying is that uh, this is like, you can, you can break this up into two scenarios, right? Uh, one on the left side of the plus sign and one on the right side of the plus sign. In the first scenario, imagine that you chose the first object. It's one of the objects that you picked. Uh, so then what you're left with is n minus 1 objects out of which you have to choose k minus 1 things. So in the 5 choose 3 case, this is equal to 4 choose 2, right? Uh, but then you can imagine the other case where you don't pick the first object. Then out of these four remaining objects, you have to pick the rest of the three. So then you get the four choose three. So basically what we did was we broke up the question of choosing three objects out of five into one where we chose the first object and then another where we didn't. And uh, you can no probably notice that you can just keep on expanding. You can turn four choose three according to the formula into three choose two plus three choose three. And with the larger numbers, you could keep going down and down. But uh, I think that's enough to illustrate this point. So uh, the last property I want to show is that n choose 0 plus n choose stop, n choose 1 plus dot 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 plus n choose n is equal to 2 to the n. So how can we say this? We know that in probability, a good technique is to consider the problem in a different way than the, than the way it's presented. So we can think of the equation on the left-hand side to be asking for all the different subsets we can get from a set of size n. Uh, you, if you look at the first term, it's saying, uh, how many different subsets of size 0 can I get? And we know that to be 1, uh, just the empty set. And then the second one is saying, how many different subsets of size n can I get? And then size of, of size 1, sorry. And then of size 2, and then all the way to n choose n, how many subsets of size n are there? Uh, and if it's obvious to you from this point that, that that's what's being asked on the left-hand side, and that the number of subsets you can get from a set of size n is 2 to the n, then you don't really need to watch the rest of the video. But I'll illustrate it with an example uh, of a set of size 3. So let's take a set with a circle, a square, and a triangle in it. And what I'm saying is that the subsets of this 
can be represented by saying 3 choose 0 plus 3 choose 1 plus 3 choose 2 plus 3 choose 3, which is equal to 2 to the 3, which is equal to 8. Uh, so let's, let's consider the first part of this. So this is saying uh, 3 choose 0. So out of this set, choose, choose uh, how many different ways can we choose 0 elements? Well, we know that to just be the empty set. Uh, and then let's look at 3 choose 1. So how many different ways are there to choose one thing? Well, you can either have a set of a circle in it or a set with a square in it or a set with a triangle in it. Okay, then let's expand 3 choose 2. Well, we can think of that as all the different subsets of size 2, which you, you can have a circle and a square, a circle and a triangle, and a triangle and a square. And then the last expression is saying 3 choose 3, which is how, what, how, how many subsets of size 3 can we get. And we know we can only get one, which has this circle, the square, and the triangle in it. So if we count these up, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's exactly what we expected, which is 8. So we've thought of the problem in terms of these subsets. And I hope you're convinced that we can think of the problem in that way. So the last thing I want to do is give you a little added intuition as to how to figure out the number of subsets of a set of size n. And what we can do is think of each of the elements in the set as a bit in a binary string of length n. And then all the subsets of, uh, of a set of size n is the same thing as how many different binary strings of length n can you make. And what I'm going to do to illustrate that is say, or say this is our binary string, and, and this represents each of the elements in a set of size n. Now you can think that when you're building the set, uh, when you're building the, all, all, these, all these subsets and trying to figure out how many there are, each of the elements in the set can either be in the subset or not in the subset. <coughs> And all the combinations, all the different ways that you can have these guys be in the subset or not in the subset will give you all the total number of subsets of the set of size n. So once we convert to thinking about strings, uh, binary strings, it becomes even easier to realize that uh, the number of total, uh, the number of, of binary strings of length n is obviously 2 to the n, uh, which is also the number of subsets in a set of size n, and is also what this equation yields. So thank you for keep sticking through my video. And as a reward, uh, here's a picture of Abraham Lincoln on a bear. Thanks.